Now, approximately 90 to 95% of the plants on Earth have an affiliation with mycorrhizal fungi. The ectomycorrhizae affiliate themselves with trees. The endomycorrhizae are the ones that actually go into the root cell itself and affiliate with oh, approximately 85% of the plants on the planet. Um, that's the corn, that's our onions, that's my apples, that's berries, that's grasses, that's legumes, all the forage crops that you grow. Um, it's endomycorrhizae involved. And the primary difference I want to point out is endomycorrhizae, the ones that penetrate into the root cell. If my, if my fist here was a feeder root, form a mycelium approximately four to eight inches around that feeder root to increase its reach for soil nutrients. Ectomycorrhizae fit on the roots, the feeder roots of trees, more like fingers fit into a tight-fitting glove, but they also have what are known as explorer hyphae, which can reach as much as 12 foot beyond the root. So endo don't go as far, ecto go as much further. And, and there's something that's gonna get involved in polyculture systems where we can tie those two together. Now, ectomycorrhizae are the ones where we see their fruiting bodies. We, we can see them on the feeder roots of plants with their eyes. We can see the chanterelles, the bolites, the matsusaki that come up in the forest because they're affiliated with specific trees. And one of the things that ectomycorrhizae do because of those long explorer hyphae is they can reach down to bedrock and extract minerals, dissolve minerals. And they do this in collaboration with bacteria. Now, when a plant is by itself without fungal friends, let's take my apple tree here, a Duchess of Oldenburg, the volume of soil that its permanent root system is in reaches out beyond the drip line of the tree. But in truth, those roots only access about 3% of the soil volume in which it sits. And on their own, they quickly can deplete nutrients that are available to them, being brought by groundwater through capillary action. But when that mycelium is around all those roots reaching out, their access to the soil volume is increased as much as a hundredfold. But it gets more fascinating than this. It wasn't until the 1880s that humans recognized that these fungi on the roots of trees, the ones they could see, were probably doing something beneficial for plants that some kind of symbiosis was involved here. This wasn't a disease. We took many, many decades to take those thoughts further. And one of the ways I like to think of this is, is we're basically still in kindergarten in terms of how much we know about all this. We've identified maybe 5% of the species in the fungal kingdom. So there's a lot more to be learned. Back in 1924, when Rudolf Steiner was giving his agricultural lectures in Germany, he talked about how the roots of plants would mesh together and they'd bring nutrients to each other and they'd defend each other. And he referred to this as what he said is the common root being. Now today, scientists use the term the common mycorrhizal network. Here's where things get really fascinating. I'm gonna to refer to this as the underground economy. So plants, which are out there in the sunshine, photosynthesizing, producing sugars, trade as much as 60, 70% of those sugars to the biology in the soil. That's because they know there's many deals to be made. But what's fascinating about the common mycorrhizal network is how the fungi shift what they ask of plants for the nutrients that they bring. And those plants that are photosynthesizing really well tend to need to pay a little bit more for the phosphorus and the trace minerals that the fungi bring so that the system as a whole can deliver nutrients to the less well-off plants. It's kind of like social democracy and it's pretty cool and we're just starting to understand how nutrients move throughout a network. And we as growers have to also recognize when we're talking about trace minerals in particular, it just takes a little bit, a nudge here and there to make metabolism as robust as possible. Now, the endomycorrhizae, the ones forming these common mycorrhizal networks primarily, we cannot see. This is a realm invisible to our eyes. 
And so I like to point out that we really have to rely on our imagination to understand what the fungi are doing for the plants, which in turn we are growing. Now endomycorrhizae are going to be responsible for nutrient density. They're going to play a big role in inducing systemic resistance to disease for the crops that we grow. Here in my orchard, say, it's not just apple trees growing in an herbicide strip with a little bit of grass, token grass between the rows. It's a community of plants. And I have a perennial system that's easy to form. You can see that right behind me. In more row cropping scenarios, market garden scenarios, we have to be more creative in integrating more plants because it really depends on a diversity of plants to support a diversity of organisms. And this is all happening by virtue of shared protoplasm. So fungi penetrate into the root cells, fungi penetrate into the intercellular species, fungi are filled with protoplasm. This is how a bi-directional flow of nutrients can occur. And those nutrients can go into one plant, which doesn't necessarily need that, and in turn be taken out through a fungal pipeline and delivered to another plant. So this is that notion of passage plants, of the network itself having an intelligence to get things to go where they are needed. And again, I'm going to totally remember, I'm in kindergarten. I don't begin to understand a lot of this. My job is to honor.